wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth, forsake her not, and she shall preserve you, love her, and she shall keep you, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding, Proverbs 4 verses 5 through 7. Everybody, welcome to the Get Understanding podcast, the Christian podcast that explores the combination of faith and everyday life. I'm your host, Kainisa Martin, and each week we dive deep into the scriptures and discuss how they apply to our lives and how they are to be applied. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Get Understanding podcast. I am your host, Kainisa Martin, and it is with great pleasure that. I present to you today's episode, Children Born in the Wilderness. Now, just as I um, just want to share briefly how just the um, excitement that surrounds um being taught in the scriptures, being open to you by the Holy Spirit, because you can read certain scriptures all the time in your your personal Bible studies and, you know, just reading of the word to um, just take it in. But when the Holy Spirit opens up the scripture, it, it just brings an excitement. And <laughs> before I um, press record to record this episode. Um, I prayed first and I was, what was I reading? So as we read the episode, we're going to be predominantly in the book of Joshua chapter five. But as, as I was just meditating on, I was going back over my, my notes a little bit, skimming over it to kind of look back on what I was reading and look back on the notes I had taken when the Holy Spirit just added the end part to it. And it's, it's, it's amazing because I thought that the notes that I took, I'm like, okay, that this is what the Lord wanted me to just share with you guys. And that was it. But the Holy Spirit said, no, this, this portion here, this, this, this is the, the piece you need to complete the episode. So, um, I'm just excited. One, um, earlier, well, um, really the beginning of the year or December coming into the beginning of the year, I can remember, um, talking on the phone with Tanisha Prelo and I was just so excited about this year. I didn't know why. And I was just saying, you know, I don't know why I say I'm just excited about this year. I just, I just know that the Lord is going to do something. I don't know what he's going to do, but I'm just excited for it. And, you know, of course there are the, the, just the daily war, um, against the kingdom of darkness and witchcraft. Sometimes, you know, you have your days where you're just, you know, just hanging on by the skin of your teeth, but then, I would that excitement would come back and I was like, I don't care what's going on. I'm excited because I know that the Lord's gonna do something. And it isn't always in that excitement that I had during the beginning of the year, which was into December into January, would um it would just be inflamed more as I see people in the body of Christ being um expanding their borders in regards to what they're doing. And I was always observing from a child and even now just looking at what the seeing the productivity in people, which is an outward working of the expansion of their minds being done by God as they're receiving deliverance and being sanctified and being made holy. And it's exciting, exciting because as I'm seeing that, and as um, I'm preparing myself for what I'm excited about, not necessarily knowing what it is, knowing that we're getting closer and closer to the culmination of this age. And it's just exciting. <clears throat> so, again, the title of this episode is Children Born in the Wilderness. 
So um, I was, um, from time to time, I would do, I would listen to um, Chuck Mesler and he has, you know, the commentary Bible studies where he goes over each book of the Bible and he does an extensive study on it. And I was um, listening to, and I listened to it on my drive to work. It's about a 40 minute drive. And I was listening to Revelation and I believe it might have been chapter six of Revelation. And a lot of times at the end of um, at the end of a chapter of the at the end of the commentary of a chapter, he would say or give us homework to say, OK, well, go read this book of the Bible because it's going to prepare you for your study on I see on this next chapter. So in this book of Revelation, I believe it was either six or seven. He was um, saying to go back and read the book of Joshua. And so I'm reading the book of Joshua and the, I got to chapter five and I, it was just, it became an extensive study or just an extensive, uh, extension of me just reading it very slowly, writing down, um, notes about what I'm seeing, um, looking up words, looking at definitions and so on and so forth. So that's where this specific episode came from. And Initially, when I started the study of Joshua chapter five, I had a different title in mind because I thought that's where my study was going, but then it ended up changing. And thus we have children born in the wilderness. So let's get started. So again, we're going to be reading from the book of Joshua chapter five. Um, and just as a little, um, laying a little bit of groundwork, um, the children of Israel were led out of Egypt by Moses, but Moses um, was not able to go into the promised land. He was able to see it, but he wasn't able to go into the promised land because he struck the rock as opposed to speaking to the rock. God instructed him to speak to the rock and he struck the rock. So he disobeyed God, um, giving the children of Israel um, that were presented before him the impression that God was angry. So um, he wasn't able to go into the promised land. And so this is just a word to those who want to be in leadership roles, who um, know they have a specific call in their life. And really anyone who's born again, we all have a responsibility. And when the Lord tells us to do something, he means to do exactly that. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Um, but again, we're going to start at um, I get my notebook. So we're going to start in chapter five again. We're going to be kind of, you know, bouncing around a little bit, but I want to start off first by reading Joshua chapter five, verse one, and it reads, and I'm reading in the King James version. And it came to pass when all the Kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until some were passed over, that their courage failed. Neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. OK, so again, these are the children of Israel. They're going into the land that was promised to them, but they're already inhabitants there. So that means this journey um, of them being in the wilderness right now is not going to be like the journey from Egypt to the promised land. Um, coming out of Egypt, we see that um, that God did the work. God parted the Red Sea for them, for them and he destroyed um, the Pharaoh and all of the, the army that followed after them in the sea. So they didn't have to fight. God did it for them. God brought them out of Egypt. But we see that um, with Joshua, whom is taking them from the wilderness into the promised land, there's there's an adversary in the land that belongs to them. So we're going to jump down to, we're going to read verse two through five, and then we're going to jump down to seven. We're starting at two. It says, at that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, make these sharp knives and circumcise again the second time. And I'm sorry, I don't think I cut that a little bit off. It says, um, and circumcise again, again, the children of Israel the second time. 
verse 3, And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. So the Lord is showing us and telling us why Joshua circumcised them for the second time. It says, all the people that came out of Egypt. So that means the, the original multitude. And we have to be mindful that it said it was a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt. So it says all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised. But all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. So we see the people, and they're in the wilderness for um, around 40 years. So those that came out of the wilderness, I'm sorry, those that came out of Egypt, they were circumcised. But those that were born in the wilderness, they were not circumcised. So what does that tell us? We already know from reading the Bible. Um, and when the children of Israel came into the wilderness that they became, they were idolatrous, all of the idolatrous nature and the idols and the idol worship and the rituals that they, um, learned in Egypt, they brought it into the wilderness. And so they abandoned the worship of of um, almighty God and they abandoned their customs so they didn't circumcise their children this is why Joshua had to circumcise the next generation so this is the generation that's born in the wilderness this is a generation that um was not under the the Abrahamic covenant which um has that token of the circumcision this is a people born in the wilderness that didn't that who really didn't know God, they any every generation is dependent on the previous generation to teach them, um, to teach them one of the of the God of their, their fathers. We see that moving forward if we read um a little bit on in Joshua that once Joshua and the elders died, there was no one to teach them about God, the, what God did, God parting the Red Sea. There was no one to teach them. So because the, the generation that came out of Egypt, they came into the wilderness and still had that pagan idolatrous nature in the heart. They came into the wilderness, built, um, created um, idols, these golden calves. They didn't circumcise their children. And so we see that Joshua circumcised this next generation that was born in the wilderness. And we're going to jump down to verse seven and it reads in their children whom he raised up. So the, the people who came out of Egypt, their children who God raised up in their place, them Joshua circumcised. So these children that are born in the wilderness. And I was just, I, as I read this, I just sat and thought about, okay, what, what would they look like? What would their, habits, their tendencies, their appetites, their desires, what did that look like if their fathers and mothers before them were idolatrous? So we can take that and look at it now, look at people now. You can look at a generation of people where their parents may say, oh, we're Christians, we're good people, and so on and so forth, but their children look like five miles of that road. Their children look like you know you wouldn't want to walk on the same side of the street as them their children look like they can't be trusted these are children that have been born in the wilderness but it says in verse 7 that God raised them up and Joshua circumcised them so that means that these children that were born in the wilderness they came under that covenant do that do the circumcision of um the Abrahamic covenant showing that and we're going to read over in um Genesis as well what that covenant actually is about the promised land and it says for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way so these 40 year duration 
the children that were born in this wilderness, they were not circumcised. So we're going to go ahead. Um, I did have a couple of notes as well. And it says, um, here it states that the Lord raised up the next generation himself and set Joshua to circumcise them. And um, circumcision was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant that said um, in Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to read one and three. It says, now the Lord has said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse of thee and then thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And we know that um, that um, in a lot of commentaries, Abraham is called the father of faith because by faith, by hearing um, the commandment of the Lord, Abram left his country, his family, his father's house. Um, well, he brought his wife and a lot came, but, and he left into a country that he didn't know, believing the promise that God made to him. And then we're going to um, also get a little bit more expansion on that promise in Genesis 17 or when that um, covenant had to be reestablished. We're going to read Genesis 17 and we're going to read verses 9 through 14. So starting at verse nine, it says, and please guys have your Bible. Do not just sit there. I don't care if you listen to every single podcast, grab a Bible. If I'm saying that I'm reading from the King James version, you need a King James version Bible in your hand. Do not rely on what I'm saying to be true. You must know for yourself that this is what the Bible is saying. You must study for yourself to show yourself approved. You cannot rely on someone else's studying to be to say that, okay, well, I've I've had my study time today. So just like I said earlier, I'll listen to commentary um or Bible studies from Chuck Mesler, but I still go back and do my own research and have my own study time. I can't rely on his study time. I have to study for myself to show myself approved unto God. And I have to be able to rightly divide the word for myself. But continuing on in verse nine, it says, and God said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant. Therefore, thou and thy seed after thee throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. So be mindful. These covenants or between God and individual individuals. So as a body, we can be a body of believers, um, born again believers coming under the covenant, the New Testament covenant in the blood of Jesus, but we must individually be born again. It's not a collective as in this group of people is saved. No, it's an individual affair. It's an individual salvation. It's a covenant between you and God individually. Um, we're reading on, it says every man child among you shall be circumcised. So again, this is the token of the, the covenant circumcision verse 11. It says, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised. I'm sorry, excuse me, shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed so that not not just biologically his those that are also bought by him as well we know in the new testament we're bought by the blood of jesus that makes us seeds of abraham according to faith as well and in verse 13 it says he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with m thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised that soul shall be cut off from his people he hath broken my covenant. So the children that were born in the wilderness, they couldn't receive the promised land because they they weren't they weren't circumcised. So they would have been at that point they were cut off. This is why Joshua had to circumcise them. Okay. 
And so we have to look at, okay, see, as I'm reading this, I'm seeing a pattern between um, what, jo- the, what Joshua had to do and what Joshua and the people had to do in order to come into the promised land and comparing that and seeing a pattern with Moses and the people that were in Egypt and what they had to do to depart from there, looking at a pattern, seeing, okay, there's something that obviously I need to be paying attention to. So with Moses, it was an exodus, meaning a a departure from a place from Egypt. With Moses, it was an exodus that had took place where the series of events were that Moses had to circumcise his son because we know that um, Moses' son initially wasn't circumcised and the Lord was about to kill him. So again, it doesn't matter what position you're in and if you're a man of God or not, you still have to obey all the requirements of the Lord. But we see that his wife ended up circumcising the son and saying that, you know, Moses was a bloody husband because of the circumcision. So had Moses not had circumcised his son, Moses would have been dead and, you know, um, that departure would not have taken place. So, um, so the circumc- a circumcision had to occur first, and then the Passover had occurred. So the circumcision, the pa- a Passover had occurred, and then the children of Israel departed from Egypt. So I'm looking at that pattern. I was reading in Joshua. I saw that pattern, but I see this pattern was first seen, or I first noticed it, where Moses had to circumcise his son first. A Passover occurred, and then they departed from Egypt. Okay, so keep keep that in your mind. That in your mind. Um, and also just to note, the Abrahamic covenant was also um to his seed after him. In some commentaries, again, Abraham is said to be the father of faith. Um, so the promised land is only for those who are his seed by faith. By faith. Okay, now this is why we see that those that come, um, that came directly out of Egypt, they didn't receive the promise, but those that were in their loins, so those that were in the loins of the people that came out of Egypt, so, um, but those that were in their loins, um, just like it stated in Hebrews 4, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So Moses is preaching to them, telling them about, you know, the promised land and, and the things that the Lord already has done for them. But being that what they were hearing was not mixed with faith, they did not profit them, which is why they died in the wilderness. But the people that were going to go into the, into the wilderness were in their loins. And God knows this all along. So if God knows that, I have a specific generation that I know is going to serve me, worship me, and obey me. But this generation has to come through a previous generation. God is after the next generation. He knows who's going to obey him. So God brought those children of the people out of Israel, knowing they were disobedient, rebellious. But that doesn't stop God from being gracious and merciful. He's still going to be gracious and merciful. He's still going to let you exercise your free will. But again, he knows that the who he's after, who's actually going into the promised land, is in their loins. Just like if we look at with Adam and Eve, the Lord saw each and every born again believer in the loins of Adam. Yes, Adam fell. Yes, God knew that Adam was going to fall. But God already had a plan of, of perfect redemption. Thank you, Lord. Now. This is why um, a lot of time when people just say, you know, I believe in God and I go to church, I read the Bible. If if none of this is mixed with faith, if nothing is mixed with faith, it will not profit you anything. The devil believes and knows God is real. He has seen him. But what does that profit him now? He's, he's still destined to be destroyed. What is belief without obedience? Okay, now we're going to go ahead and jump down to verse 9 and 10. And it reads, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. 
Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Um, in verse 10, it says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the place, I mean, I'm sorry, in the plains of Jericho. So again, we see that um, we're going to read a little bit, um, a little bit further that circumcision had to occur, which is a separation. The Passover had to be um, observed. And then now they're going to depart from the wilderness into the promised land. And what I would like to um, just point out what the Lord said to Joshua. He said, this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt off of you. So the reproach of Egypt of the world is in the flesh. In the wilderness, the flesh has to be dealt with. God brings, now I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but the Lord brings us into the wilderness to deal with the flesh because the flesh cannot be dealt with if it's still in an environment where it's empowered. God is, is amazing in his wisdom. And this is why he deserves all the glory, honor, and praise and worship because who in the world could think of such an immaculate, perfect salvation? Nobody. Okay. We're going to read, um, I'm going to jump down to verses 13 and 15, Let's see, 13 and 15, and it reads, and it came to pass, so this is after um, they observed the Passover, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went unto him and said, art thou for us? or for our adversaries. So he's saying, are you fighting with us on our side or are you fighting on the enemy side? In verse 14, it says, and he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So this is how we know, we just from reading the Bible and paying, observing, observing what's being said, what's not being said, observing body language just from um, verbal cues and what we're reading. Anytime that somebody falls down to worship, um, whether it's a person or whether it's an angel, they always tell that person to get up. But here Joshua fell um, to the earth, with his face to the earth, bowed down in worship, but he was not instructed to get up. He just said, take your shoes off your feet. This is holy ground. So I personally believe that this is Jesus Christ. This is what I personally believe, that this is Jesus Christ. Now. We see that there's a slight difference between the departure from Egypt and the departure from the wilderness. In the departure from Egypt, we see that one, like I already pointed out, that the Lord did it all. The Lord gave them favor before they left to bring, you know, gold and everything else, um, provisions. And then obviously Pharaoh didn't want to let them go, but God part of the Red Sea as the Pharaoh and his army tried to follow after them. He killed them and drowned them in the Red Sea. God did that all on his own. The people, they didn't have to fight and they have to lift a finger. God did every single thing. They see, we have to see the power of God, God doing it all on his own. But we see the departure from, um, we see that the departure from the wilderness that there's a battle, there's a fight. And who's leading it? It's not, it's not, it's not Joshua leading it. It's just like when um God was preparing Gideon and his army, excuse me, the adversary said that it's God and Gideon. So it's just like, okay, God is leading the charge, but alongside him is Gideon. So we see that the captain of the Lord of hosts, he's leading them into battle, into the promised land. 
So it's the captain of the Lord of hosts in Joshua. It's, it's, the Lord is leading us into the promised land. And this is this is what the excitement is about. But we have to fight. It's not, we cannot do it on our own. We have to fight, but we have to be led into battle by a captain, one who is who is a, a warlord. But we see that what was addressed before they could go into the promised land, the Lord God said that during after that circumcision, now the reproach of Egypt has been rolled away. So in the wilderness, to prepare to prepare for battle, we must separate from the flesh. We cannot go into the promised land with flesh. We cannot take. We cannot go, we cannot fight the adversary being one with the adversary. So the Lord brings us into the wilderness. The Lord brought the children of Israel into the wilderness to remove the flesh, to be rid of the flesh. So even children born in the wilderness that look absolutely psychotic and insane right now, the Lord is raising them up himself circumcising their hearts himself and they will we will go into the promised land because we're going to fight into the get to get in the promised land we're already used to um or i would say not so much of so many religious traditions and relying on church attendance and things of that nature to say well i'm a good person or um, I'm a Christian and even there, there even are some individuals that are sitting in delusions, think that they're thinking that they're Christians because they go into a building called a church. Excuse me. I apologize. A building called a church, but the Lord is raising up children born in their wilderness, circumcising their hearts, preparing them for war, preparing them to receive their inheritance as children of faith and it's happening today now uh, again we just note that um looking at my notes we see some of the same progress with the slight difference i just spoke about um it's like we're gonna look at back at Matthew eleven chapter. I'm sorry, Matthew eleven verse twelve. It says, "From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force." So, in order to go to the promised land, you have to be violent and take it by force because there is there are adversaries that don't want you, that don't want us to receive our inheritance. I'm about to um wrap it up, but. God pulls the old man out of Egypt to kill it in the wilderness. So we know the old man, the flesh, the, the, the first Adam, that Adamic nature. God pulls, takes the old man out of the flesh. So he saves us. He calls us. He pulls us out of the world, out of Egypt, brings us into the wilderness to kill the flesh. In order to get the get to the new man that will go into the promised land, because it is his by rightful inheritance. So the inheritance is to the new man, to the spirit man. Heaven is promised to the new man, the the, the spirit of the spirit that has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, not this flesh. So just like what happened in the natural with the children of Israel going from coming out of the coming coming out of Egypt, going into the wilderness, those that were born in the wilderness being circumcised to have um, the reproach of Egypt rolled off of them through that circumcision, the natural circumcision, and then going into the promised land being led by the captain of the Lord of hosts and Joshua for us right now. Jew and Gentile. When the Lord saves us, he is taking us out of Egypt. We go into the wilderness, religious wilderness, whatever type of wilderness. And in the wilderness, the Lord is killing the flesh. Death to the old man. Persecution brings 
death to the old man. Self-denial brings death to the old man. Deliverance breaks agreements and covenants that were cut with the things we joined to in the world, in Egypt. The Lord deals with that in the wilderness because it will not, again, excuse me, the old man receives nothing of the spirit. The old man is not is not promised the promised land. The, the promised land is not an inheritance for the old man, for the flesh. It is for the new man. It's for the spirit that has been regenerated by the spirit of God. And what had got me excited before I, um, after prayer and before I recorded is that seeing it in the New Testament. I always try to find, okay, I see this Lord in the Old Testament. I see the natural portion of it i see the spiritual portion of it in the old testament but where is this in the new testament and the lord shows it to us with the lord jesus christ it's the 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 holy spirit is is amazing so ladies and gentlemen boys and girls we are going to turn to matthew and i'm pretty sure like the holy spirit is just already then you know where we're going with this but we're going to go to matthew um chapter 3 and we're going to read verses 15 um let me see we're going to read verses 15 and we're going to go down to 4 um and it says and Jesus answered and said unto him speaking of John the Baptist suffer it to be so now for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness because Jesus um, came to John the Baptist to be baptized because, again, Jesus Christ is our example. He's our standard. And it says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and, lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And, lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is the key part, verse four, chapter one. I'm sorry, um, verse, I'm sorry, chapter four, verse one. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And um, we know that after Jesus was tempted and tempted, but without sin, He came out of the wilderness. He came out of the wilderness in the power of the spirit. Come on, y'all. Like, come on now. Jesus Christ also in in the world as far as um, not coming into his ministry as of yet, not being baptized in the Holy Ghost because he has to have been baptized in the Holy Spirit to actually start his ministry, to be empowered to do so. But living a life as a carpenter son originally, going to going into synagogues, um, you know, I'll, I'll offer obviously um, honoring the Sabbath and so on and so forth. So going from a regular everyday, you know, regular life, then after being baptized, he was led into the wilderness. Now, when we are in the wilderness. The Lord is dealing with our flesh. And we know, for those of you whom have really been born again, the devil is going to tempt you. He's going to try to tempt you. He's going to try to draw and seduce you through your flesh. This is how God is dealing with our flesh, through the devil, through Satan. Because Satan by nature is an adversary, he's an accuser, and he just doesn't like you. So he's a great tester. So the Lord deals with our flesh through the devil. Yes. In the wilderness. So we see that Jesus Christ was led into the wilderness. And we see that, and um, I forget off the top which book it is, but in another, you know, another one of the gospels, it says that Jesus was in the wilderness with the beasts. So God takes us into the wilderness to deal with the beast. I mean, the the flesh is the beast. Animalistic um, nature led by the five carnal senses. The flesh 
is a beast. It's an animal. So the Lord takes us into the wilderness to kill off the flesh, to kill off the old man so that we can, we, when we come out, when, and the Lord, Lord only knows what has to take place for us individually, but to come out in the power of the spirit into the promised land, promised land where the kingdom of God has come within you, where you're completely conscious of God, where you know, and you walk in the authority as um, a child of God. It's, it's, it's amazing. So what we have to do as children born in the wilderness is allow the Lord access to our souls to really drive a dagger through and put his finger on every covenant, every agreement that we came into with demons, with hell, with death, while we were in the world. And to kill the flesh, to subdue and just have authority over our souls so that we can be trusted with the power of the spirit period stay encouraged I still believe that this year is going to be explosive I don't know what's going to happen I don't know I, I, I don't know but I just know that for me I am going to prepare for whatever the Lord has planned and he knows he knows how to prepare me he knows how to prepare you so just about having a sincere heart to want to be complimentary to the Lord. And that's one thing for about almost a month now that has just been, that has just been on my mind and where my heart and where my prayers, um, what a lot of my prayers are, it's about being complimentary to the will of God, to the body of Christ, to Jesus Christ, because no matter what happens between myself and any other individual, God is always faithful. He's always been faithful to me. And I want to, in, in being complimentary to him, by default, I will be complimentary to the body of Christ. If I'm to be married, then by me being complimentary to the will of God, then I will be complimentary to my husband. If I'm complimentary to the will of God, then every mission and vision that he's given to his children that he wants me to um, aid in, then I will be complimentary to it, not try to tear it down, but wanting to see the will of God fulfilled, not looking at people, but realizing this is the will of God and pray, Lord, how can I be complimentary to your will in this area, to the vision you've given to this person, Lord, how can I be complimentary to it? That's what it's about. So when we look past people and look to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, and just pray, Lord, I want to be complimentary to your will. Lord, if you've given a vision to this person for a specific mission, please help me and show me how I can be complimentary. And he's already given you gifts and talents, especially when you're in a specific um, portion of the body of Christ that will complement that vision. I mean, the church at um, Ephesians they complemented one another. If they were in a specific area, a specific congregation, the Lord gave each of them gifts and talents to complement one another so that nobody would lack. But it's again about looking past people, looking to God and believing, really believing that God has given a person a vision that belongs to him and you want to complement God's vision, not a person's vision, God's vision. And at that point, you will be able to look past the 
the shortcomings of people because they are carrying a vision that God has given them. In regards to what that vessel does, you want to see God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's the prayer. I thank you all for listening. Um, and I just pray that, you know, if you haven't found out what the Lord has gifted you with, I just pray that, or I would suggest that you just ask the Lord to show you how you've been made to be complimentary to his will. Um, so that's the prayer. You guys take care. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth, forsake her not, and she shall preserve you, love her, and she shall keep you, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding, Proverbs 4 verses 5 through 7.